Hey guys, welcome back to Unmedicated and Dysfunctional. I'm Kenz. Today we're going to jump right back into Seiya no Uda, or in English, Song of Seiya. I was browsing through Steam and some of the images from this game popped up, and I have to say it is absolutely stunning. Um, so we are going to keep pushing through this, and I didn't want to just drop off this game since the story does... Um, from what I've heard, get really, really good as you progress through. And I think we're starting to get past all of that buildup in the game. So, jumping right in. Also want to recognize that this music is absolutely beautiful. I don't remember it being like this. So, here we go. After Koji and the others dropped me off, I paused a while to regard my surroundings. I had lived my entire life on this block. In this house, there was no other place I could call home. After Koji and the others dropped me off, I paused a while to regard my surroundings. I had lived my entire life on this block, in this house where uh, there was no other place I could call home. Wait, whoa, I think I just started over. Okay, but nothing was remembered. As I walked up the path to the front door and took in the yard where I had spent my childhood, I could feel those memories being defiled by the twisted, festering shapes around me. Blech. Inside the house, I found nothing familiar, nothing to offer me comfort and warmth. What I had once called home was now a whole other world. I have no home. I whispered with a smile of self-pity. There was one last stop to make, one last nail to hammer into my coffin. Oh. I stepped into the room that had cradled me from childhood. The walls were prepared papered with human entrails, the bed tangled mess of worm flesh. But none of that mattered. There, curled up on the bed like an abandoned cat was Saya. As I stood there in shock, she looked up at me and a tiny, weak voice said, Can I really stay? I responded by sweeping her into my arms, embracing her tightly so that she would not escape. Saya did not resist. I'm still a little bit confused on their relationship because I don't quite understand the age difference. I don't, she just seems so much younger. When she arrives at the Sakisaka house, Omi first takes a deep breath to calm herself. Her anger does not vanish entirely, of course, but at least now she can hear herself think. While waiting for response from the intercom, she looks over the patch of yards she can see from the outside gate. Even Omi isn't normally one to complain about other people's housekeeping, but this isn't- this is going too far. The grass is growing wild and there are piles of dead leaves scattered everywhere. It doesn't just look untended, it looks like an uninhabited ruin. It's still light out, but every window has its storm shutters tightly sealed. Omi guesses that they've been closed since morning. What kind of life is Fuminora leading? Even if he's living alone, he can't neglect his housework forever. And is it just her imagination, or does something stink like rotten meat? It couldn't be coming from the yard, could it? There's still no, no response, so she presses the buzzer a second time, and a third, and a fourth. Finally, after this has gone on for over ten minutes, Omi loses her patience and opens the cover to the intercom. As she expected, the power has been disconnected. Perhaps Fuminori has a good reason for shutting out the world, but Omi can only see it as a lack of respect for others. Her anger rekindled. She pushes the gate open and stomps through the yard to the front door. Given the state of his intercom, she doubts that Fuminori will spawn to a knock. So, Omi decides to just open the door and go in shouting, and if the door is locked, she'll have to... Surprisingly, the doorknob turns easily in her hand, and the enraged Omi finds herself throwing the door open wider than she intended. Her nostrils are instantly assaulted by a choking stench. Ugh. <laughs> what is that smell? <laughs> As Omi stands petrified in the threshold, the cowbell hanging on the inside of the door chimes loudly. A moment later... <laughs> Welcome home! <laughs> Ew, that's gotta be Saya. I knew she wasn't human. I knew she wasn't human. Because she looks human to Fuminori. So now she's not human to everyone else. Omi can't believe her ears. The voice she just heard could not have been human. Yet 
The intonations were so too complex for any Better animal she can imagine. Is someone there? She calls out to the end of the hallway from which the voice came. There's no response. Instead, she hears the sound of something soft and wet flopping deeper into the house. <laughs> Finding it difficult to place meaningful image to the voice she just heard, Omi stares blankly at the empty vesicle. There's nothing there, not even Fuminori's shoes, which can only mean he's still outside somewhere wearing them. The house should be empty, but then what's that voice from just now? Her anger has vanished as if it were never there. Nevertheless, Omi sets foot into the hallway, leaving the door open so that the cowbell won't ring. The floor creaks, setting her nervous on edge. Omi isn't sure why she's acting like a burglar, but something tells her not uh, to make as little noise as possible. The potency of the stink inside the house makes the whiff she caught outside pale in comparison. It's sickening, like rotten fish guts. Has food been left out to spoil in the kitchen? She hears a bubbling sound up ahead. Stepping gingerly on the creaking floorboards, Omi makes her way to the end of the hallway. She finds rooms to both sides of her, one lit, the other dark. She chooses to look into the lit room. It's the kitchen, lit by what must be the only window in the house not covered by storm shutters. The sound she heard was the pot boiling on the stove, and on the chopping board next to it lie a butcher's knife and some half-diced carrots, a perfectly normal household scene with the light of the setting sun making everything the color of decomposing fruit. Something is wrong. Who is cooking here, and where did they go? Is anyone here? Only calls, regretting the immediately as she realizes her voice is shaking. Her words echo vainly through the silent house. She begins to feel foolish and defenseless. Suddenly she feels something cold seeping through her pantyhose. She immediately reaches down to touch her feet. Her fingertips come away covered in a viscous olive green slime like the filthy water from a tank long clogged with algae and dead fish. The whole floor is covered with it. It must be the source of the stench. Omi now wishes that she had worn her shoes inside, managed to be damned. When she looked back, ruefully, the way she came, she realizes that her current position is not visible from the entrance. The kitchen must be where the strange voice came from. The next room is probably the den, as she expected from the closed storm shutters, it's pitch black outside. Omi wants nothing more than to flee the house, but that would mean turning her back to the darkness. And that, she simply cannot bring herself to do. Ooh. Moved by some irrational compulsion, Omi sets foot into the den. It's too dark to see anything and sinks far worse than before. She slides her hand along the wall, feeling the light switch, finding it much sooner than she expected. She flips it on like her last hope. The colors! The co so many colors! The purple of entrails, the brown of rotten meat, the crimson of fresh blood, the yellow of fat. These colors are, and more that cannot be described, cover every inch of the room in maddening array. The colors say all that needs to be said about the painter's hatred, malice, and insanity. <laughs> Omi's legs give out from the shock, sending her to the floor. Slime immediately slopes through her jeans. It's cold tendrils creeping up her legs, crotch, and her neck. Her hand flies to her neck, where she is greeted by another drop of chilly slime. Above her, something is dripping down on her head, making perhaps the worst decision of her leg. Omi looks up. The predator clinging to the ceiling, poised to leap upon its prey. She sees it in every detail. Woo! Her mouth and nose are sealed before she can scream and her belly is torn open with something enters to feast on her innards. But by the time she feels any of this, Omi's already gone mad. This story is really kicking up its pace. All right. I bit the bullet and tried to take the train, but the rush hour crowds were so bad that I had to get off halfway and walk. I'm running pretty late, is Saya worried? I hope she's not mad. You're not going to like your dinner tonight. <laughs> when I entered the yard, I realized that the front door had been left wide open. 
Light from the living room was seeping into the hallway, and I hear what sounds like someone smacking their lips. There's also a tantalizing fragrance in the air. Is it Saya? I consider calling out to her, but decide to enter in silence instead. Something smells strange, though not unpleasant. The aroma is quite soothing, in fact. It reminds me of Saya's hair. <laughs> First, I am surprised by what I see in the living room. The floor is covered with what looks like to be some kind of grass. Probably the source of an herb-like smell, and there are fruit or vegetable-like balls of varying size scattered everywhere. Saya? Saya? <laughs> e Saya turns around, her eyes wide with surprise. She looks away sheepishly like a child caught in some prank. Look at... Look at that face. Look at... Like, it's like she knew she was going to get caught and didn't want to get caught, but she did get caught, and now we're here. What are you eating? This is, um, uh, well, she stammers so flustered that I suddenly feel bad for sneaking up on her. Remembering that she has never eaten in front of me before, I realize that she must be quite embarrassed. Can I have one? I scoop up the closest fruit thing and pop it into my mouth, ignoring Saya's attempt to wave me off. It has a strange texture, soft and pa Oh, pliable like a peach or a pear. When I bite into it with my back teeth, a succulent juice fills my mouth. Combined with a sharp, strong fragrance, it's unlike anything I've ever tasted. How did you make this? What did you use? It wasn't hard. I just took it apart and melted it a little to make it easier to eat. It's practically raw. Oh? Picked up a different lump that... Ugh, this one consisting of a fruity flesh around a hard core. Tearing a chunk off in my mouth, I find that it has a similar taste to the last one. Hey, are you okay? That's a... Yeah, even I can eat this. In fact, it's good. Really? At first, Saya looks dumbstruck, but then she bursts out laughing. So this is what you like. Now I feel stupid for going through all the trouble. Is this what you always eat, Saya? Yeah, though it's been a while since I've had one so big, I usually catch them in the nearby park. There's an impressive nature preserve not too far from here. I've always heard about fruits like these growing there, but, well, of course, they only look like fruit to me. They're really something else. Sorry, I already ate the best parts. That's okay, there's always next time. And now we can eat together. Yeah! Saya seems really happy. I'm happy too, of course. Eating with someone is much more fun than eating alone, and it makes the food taste better too. There's still plenty left. It'll keep chilled for two or three days though. It won't taste as good. Then we better start putting it away. <laughs> Sealing the small fruits and Tupperware and large ones and pots and bowls, Say and I store the remaining food in the refrigerator. Thinking of tomorrow's dinner fills me with anticipation. I feel that, little by little. I'm starting to regain the joy of living. Uh, Saya will guide me with her. I can live on. Ew. Ew. True Scary Stories, Hospital Edition. Chapter 4, The Monster in the Hospital. A medical student relates his shocking experiences. Will you believe him or not? Strange things starting to happen at the hospital around the end of last spring. It began with patients waking up in the middle of the night screaming. They all smoke, spoke of terrifying nightmares and many of them had to be sedated. Some patients even tra transferred to other hospitals because of it. The weird thing was that they'd all had the exactly same dream. A dream about some horribly disgusting monster staring down at them from their bedside. But the real strange stuff started happening after that. There used to be a lot of stray cats around campus looking for scraps from the students. One day the cats suddenly disappeared and it wasn't that they'd stopped coming. It was more like they'd vanished from the area entirely and then people stopped walking their dogs around. According to rumors, the dogs were refusing to go anywhere near the school. Eventually, things started going missing in the hospital. Organs, to be precise. Transplant organs kept disappearing from storage. People came close to losing their jobs over it. 
And it wasn't just two or three times that it happened. They tried to keep it from students, but we heard it was a lot worse than that. People started saying that there was something living in the hospital. The janitors would find strange messes that could only have been made in the middle of the night, traces of something that had crawled down the hallway, or weird stains caused by something dripping through the ceiling. The late shift nurses talked about hearing strange noises on some nights, and patients woke screaming. There's one last story, one you can never mention inside the hospital. One day, the obstetrics department went crazy. They said that a newborn had disappeared in the night. If that were true, police would have come and it would have been all over the news, but they say the big shots managed to make it all go away. It's just a rumor, of course. These strange incidents st suddenly stopped toward the end of summer. Now there are almost no patients complaining of nightmares, and the cats have started coming back to campus. But still, what happened in the hospital that summer, even now, just thinking about it gives me the creeps. Twilight Zone. <sighs> They're gonna figure out that she's missing. Nothing. <laughs> This is the third day in a row that they haven't been able to get in touch with Omi. There's no sign that she returned to her apartment, and even her family doesn't know anything. Her parents have already filed Ooh. a missing persons report. Well, you know her. She'll probably just pop up somewhere like nothing happened. I hope so. Your reply is with a gloomy expression. She's worried about Omi, of course. But the incident with Fuminori three days ago must still be weighing on her as well. Yo hasn't seen Fuminori since, and Fuminori hasn't made any effort to approach her or Koji. Four people used to meet in the cafeteria between classes, but now there are only two. Hey, Koji? Let's keep thinking. Isn't there somewhere Omi might have gone? No, Koji answers evasively. I've already checked everywhere. It's a lie, of course. Koji knows where Omi planned to go that evening, but he doesn't want to bring Fuminori up in front of Yo. Their awkward silence is mercifully broken by the bell signaling the start of the next period. <laughs> well, I've got to go. <laughs> yeah. Unless Koji is mistaken, Yo is supposed to have class next period too. But she just sits there, staring off into space. <laughs> Unable to come up with anything to say, he leaves the cafeteria reluctantly. Both Omi's disappearance and Yo's depression worry Koji, and both problems lead back to the exact same place. What the heck is Fuminori doing? When Omi went missing, the first thing he did was question Fuminori. After all, the last time he'd seen her was just before she stormed off to give Fuminori a piece of her mind. Fuminori responded with an unequivocal denial and acted like he hadn't the slightest idea why Omi would have gone to see him. Perhaps that was only natural as he was unaware that Omi and Koji hadn't witnessed him reduce Yo to tears. Did Omi even make it to Fuminori's house? She had been riding a wave of emotion when she'd left and might have calmed down and changed her mind halfway there. Or perhaps she ran into trouble on the way? Koji concluded, or more accurately, convinced himself that one of the possibilities was the truth, subconsciously denying that one remaining possibility, that Fuminori was lying, that he had met Omi and was involved with her disappearance. When questioned by the police, Koji told the truth about Omi's destination only up the train station, maintaining that he had no idea where she planned to go after that. He wanted to cooperate and search, of course, but Omi couldn't have made it to Fuminori's house. Fuminori said so himself, didn't he? In that case, he told the police everything he needed to know. Not wanting to get uh, the still fragile Fuminori involved, he forced himself to accept the flimsy logic. But the conflict built up inside him without his notice, leaving unanswered suspicion to, faster, uh, to fester in his mind. Koji is deep in thought, paying no attention to his surroundings, but perhaps that is what allows him to catch sight of his friend's back through the crowd of mailing students, students, of milling students. Fuminori. Fuminori. 
At first, Koji assumes that he's headed to the lecture hall, but it soon appears that instead he's going home. Strange, medical students have required courses in the afternoon. Though he is initially surprised, Koji hesitantly, uh, Koji's hesitation lasts for only a second. He follows his friend, taking care to stay far behind what he will, so he won't be noticed. Do -do -do -do. Fuminari wasn't going home, as became obvious when he boarded the train heading the opposite direction. Koji's ne next guess was that he was going to see the doctor at the T University Hospital. The Fuminori rode straight through the closest station. Where is he going? At first, Koji felt ashamed for tailing his friend like this, but his conscience fell silent as Fuminori's actions grew more and more mysterious. The stranger it gets, the closer Koji feels in discovering the truth behind Fuminori's sudden transformation. Any knowledge would be welcome, no matter how slight. Even Koji is beginning to think that there must be more behind Fuminori's change than the accident alone. He wants to be more—he wants a more satisfying answer, one that will help him decide whether Fuminori can still be trusted. Fuminori gets off at a small station in a nondescript suburb of Tokyo. Koji follows trying not to lose sight of him amid the other disembarking passengers. The area is quite desolate, with only a small bookstore, a convenience store, and a market in front of the train station. It is easy for Koji to keep Fuminori in view. The neighborhood was carved out of Fuji foothills, and here and there, steep inclines and wooden areas that escaped assimilation. Koji is a mage! Koji is amazed that such a place exists less than an hour out of central Tokyo. Fumonori seems to know the streets. He moves quickly and purposefully through the suburb community, his eyes fixed straight ahead. Before long, Fumonori reaches a house. Without ringing the bell or even knocking, he opens the door and vanishes inside, leaving Koji to wonder how Fumonori can treat this house as his own. After waiting to see if Fumonori comes back out, Koji approaches the gate and checks the nameplate. Ogai, it reads. Koji has never heard of anyone by that name among Fuminori's acquaintances. Next, his attention is drawn to a thick wad of leaflets sticking out the mail slot. This coupled with the general uh, dilapidated feel of the place suggesting that it had been abandoned for some time. A small playground about two blocks away provides an ad adequate vantage point from which to watch the front of the Ogai home. Fortunately, it does not appear to be the sort of house that has a rear exit. Koji settles down on the bench and begins his stakeout. I should have brought more smokes. One hour passes and then another, but there remains no sign of movement around the Ogai residence. Soon, twilight settles upon the neighborhood. After Koji's one pack of cigarettes runs out, the stakeout becomes a battle against mounting impatience. He kills time by redialing Omi on his cell phone and sending her short text messages, but his efforts are futile, as he knew they would be. When the sky begins to turn deep blue and the streetlights come on, Fuminori finally emerges the house and heads back towards the station with some hurried stride. After some brief consideration, Cody decides that right now investigating the house is more important than tailing Fuminori. He rings the doorbell just to make sure after receiving the expected silence in response, he checks to make sure no one is watching and turns the doorknob. The door is not locked. Whose house is this? The moment he enters the house, stale air thick with mold and dust fills Koji's nostrils. It is unmistakable smell that the house has long lain untouched. There is also a faint hint of something else in the air, something reminiscent of damp stewers or... Uh, fetid cisterns. Flipping the light switch does nothing. The power must be cut off. Koji uses his cigarette lighter to illuminate the immediate area and the thick dust covering the floor. He sees several brand new trails of footprints that could have only been made by shoes. Fuminori's. Koji decides to follow suit and dispense with courtesy. He enters with his shoes on. The lighter's flickering flame pushes back a deathly silence and gloom of the house. Koji is surprised to see evidence of life remaining. Everything from furniture to tableware and appliances, nothing seems to be missing. 
The thickness of dust suggests that the house has been empty for several months, which means that the owner must have left with little more than clothes on his back. Could he have gone on a long vacation? The calendar in the den is turned to April. Oh, 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 something happened. No one is living here, but that does not have to mean the owner left. Maybe he was murdered and his rotting corpse is right under Koji's feet. He finds himself wanting a stronger light. A flashlight in his hand would make him feel much better. Koji follows Fuminori's footsteps to the second floor, where he begins to catch a scent of paper in the stale air. It is the smell of old books, instantly recognizable to anyone who has worked in an antique bookstore or library. The first room on the second floor turns out to be a study, its towering shelves packed with such vast numbers of books that Koji fears for the stability of the floor. As a medical student himself, he is able to discern that at a glance that his study belongs to a medical professional and a high-level one at that. Judging by the content of the books, a smorgasbord of technical volumes far beyond the simple student's understanding, the owner's interests lie in the medical research than with the clinical practices. Fuminori must have spent most of his time here. The scattered dust suggests that he's searching for something, and the contents of the desk drawers are obvious disarray. A small pile of books stacked on the side table catches his eye. Being next to the desk, they must have been the most frequently read. Their nature could shed some light on the character of the person who has worked here. Koji frowns as he examines the three books. These aren't scientific texts like the rest, but old leather-bound western tomes, like the sort you would find in a rare bookstore. The titles are meaningless to him. Trey de Chiffre appears concerns semiotics by arts magna... Uh, but Mark's Magna et Ultima is some kind of treatise on divination. And then there's Voynich Manuscript, which looks like some sort of picture book. When the pages through it, he finds the text utterly incomprehensible. Maybe there's some kind of cipher. Whenever they're, uh, when it, whatever they are, they clearly have nothing to do with medicine, refuting Koji's earlier guess that the Ogai was a doctor. Looking down, Koji sud suddenly notices a glint of something black and metallic underneath the chair. A pocket-sized flashlight, quite out of place among all these dusty books. Fuminori must have brought it in. With relief, Koji exchanges his lighter for the flashlight. Its tiny body emits a powerful white beam that casts away the darkness. His courage restored, he decides to explore the rest of the house. Mm hmm? Uh huh? Koji notices something strange, something that was not visible in the lights. Lighter's weak flame. The slime. Dark, oily stains are everywhere. The stains are especially thick around the doorknobs and stair banisters, like someone grasped them with hands wrapped in a greasy cloth. Looking closer, he seems. He sees places where slime was splashed low on the wall, almost as if a wet mop was run violently across the floor. Could Ogai have made these marks? If so, how? Koji begins to feel sick as, his, as he imagines a man shambling through the house with slime dripping from his body. Finding the bedroom next to the study, Koji collects, checks the closet on a hunch. He discovers two empty suitcases, not what you would leave behind when going on a long vacation. A sudden chill runs through him. Whoever was living here is still somewhere inside the house. Suppressing the urge to flee, Koji goes back downstairs to check the first floor. If he finds a corpse, he'll have to call the police right away. He might get away with trespassing if he reports it first, but if they find the body later, it'll be awfully hard to explain his fingerprints all over the house. The flashlight reveals the den to be covered in more, in even more slime than the rest of the house. The sofa looks as though it was dredged from bottom of a swamp. <laughs> in the kitchen, Koji takes one look at the sink and decides not to get any closer. He doesn't want any more fuel for his imagination. He reaches the door of the bathroom. A common scene from TV dramas flashes through his head. A body with slit wrists floating in a bathroom bathtub full of water. It wasn't uh, and wasn't there a movie where a hitman disposes of his victim in a bathtub filled with lye? 
Koji braces himself for the worst and opens the door slowly, then shines his light into the ceramic bathtub and appears from the darkness like a white ghost. Bones. A mountain of bones, black with dry flesh and blood. Koji puts one hand against the wall to steady himself as his legs threaten to buckle. Something is wrong, he realizes as he tries to desperately to get his thoughts in order. The bones are too small and there are too many of them. These aren't human. After taking several deep breaths to calm himself, Koji enters the bathroom and examines the tub. The bones are piled atop each other like fallen leaves. They appear to be from small animals, perhaps cats or dogs? Even so, the quantity of is mind-boggling. How many bodies would it take to produce this many bones? The bones have all been separated from one another, so it doesn't look like bodies were just thrown in the tub and left to rot. Each bone is covered with deep grooves, marks left by teeth biting through flesh. Koji's sanity won't let him consider the possibilities that a human could have done this. The owner of the house must have kept some sort of carnivorous animal as a pet, giving it the bones of small animals to eat, disposing of the remains in the bathtub. But why not dispose of the leftovers properly? They could have just been thrown out with the garbage, or was there something keeping him from leaving the house? The relief of Koji felt when he realized that the bones weren't human is once again under attack. In the first place, what the hell was Fuminori doing there? Uh-oh. What's wrong, Koji? <laughs> Koji whirls around, his light revealing Fuminori's expressionless face. You're trespassing. So are you, Koji replies, barely managing to speak over the pounding of his heart. Fuminori pushes past Koji and looks at the bathtub. He doesn't even flinch at the sight of the bones. A friend of mine lives here. I'm just running an errand. What? Who's this person? Where did you meet them? Koji doesn't want to believe that the old friend... Uh, that the old friendly Fuminori could have had contact with the Denzians of this house. I'll introduce you one of these days, he says, turning to leave without a glance at Koji. I owe her my life. Oi, Fuminori. Hey, Fuminori! Koji runs after Fuminori. His heart is finally beating normally again. Wait, is that friend of yours the reason you've been acting so strange? Standing in the entrance, Fuminori glares coldly at Koji over his shoulder. The utter lack of emotion in his eyes gives Koji a pause. You followed me, didn't you? Koji swallows. What can he say? You're starting to bother me, Koji. Don't do it again. Uh, Fine. Fuminori walks away with another word, leaving Koji alone in the entrance. Up until this very moment, concern for his friend was still at the forefront of his mind. Now, however, that concern is swiftly giving away and growing the sense of dread. Does the Fuminori he knew no longer exist? Was the person who just stared Koji down an imposter wearing Fuminori's skin? Koji had begun to believe that it might be so. Alright guys, we're going to stop here. Um, again, I'm really starting to enjoy the story. It was kind of a little bit draggy at the beginning, but now there's a lot happening. Um, so we are going to keep up with this one. Don't worry, we will be finishing it. Um, thank you guys so much for being here and for checking it out. I really appreciate it. If you're new to the channel, welcome to the family. If you've been here um longer thank you so much i do appreciate the support and uh you guys are absolutely fantastic i wouldn't be here without you so thank you so much as always i will see you in the next one bye <laughs>